Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to another webinar organized by ANT Neuro. My name is Farnoosh Safavi. I'm the head of education at ANT and upstream product manager of speech mapping in Imagine. I'm very glad to be hosting today's session, which is about intraoperative electrical versus preoperative TMS language mapping from a linguist perspective. Our presenter today is Dr. Olga Dragoy, who is the director of the Center for Language and Brain uh, at the National uh, Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow, Russia. Her current research interests uh, extend to neurosurgical populations, tumor and epilepsy, in which she transfers linguistic and neuroscientific advances to immediate clinical practice. Olga recently also developed a comprehensive Russian intraoperative uh, linguistic battery for mapping language with direct electrical stimulation during awake craniotomy, uh, which is becoming more and more the gold standard for Russian neurosurgery fields and clinics. After her presentation, uh, Sebastian and Antonia from ANT Neuro will walk you through the workflows of Wiser2 and how a neuronavigated TMS procedure can be done in order to help the neurosurgeon locate language eloquent areas and eventually avoid the uh, resection, um, the resection to the extent possible. There will be a short Q&A uh, session afterwards and we will receive your questions in the meantime. We can type them in the questions chat box. Also, you will see some poll questions in the course of the presentation, uh, which will require your active uh, participation and uh, we will appreciate your input to make it more interactive. All right, so let's get started. Olga, uh, many thanks for accepting our invitation and being with us here today. Uh, the stage is yours and uh, we're looking forward. Thank you. Ah. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Farnoosh and Sebastian and Frank and the entire ANT company for uh, suggesting me, for inviting me to give this talk and for uh, sharing my thoughts about uh, comparison of uh, the intraoperative electrical language mapping uh, with the direct electrical stimulation and preoperative TMS language mapping. Um, I should state in the, from the very beginning that I have nothing to disclose uh, except my genuine research and clinical interests. Um, and, uh, uh, but I have to tell you right away that I'm uh, much more experienced with um, intraoperative language mapping. And in my lab at the Center for Language and Brain in High School of Economics, one will start doing uh, preoperative TMS mapping. This is why this topic is of great interest to me personally and to my staff members, because we're trying to find out uh, the best uh, practice for uh, this kind of methodology. Um, okay. Um, and to get acquainted with uh, the audience, I would like uh, to ask to stop the, the first poll uh, and see uh, who you guys are and what you prefer to use. Okay, the poll is running. Let's give this 30 seconds or so. Hmm? What do you prefer? <laughs> Three. Right. <laughs> okay, I read out the results to you. Um, Eighteen percent say I often prefer TMS. Five percent I often prefer DES. Fifty percent I use both, and twenty-seven percent I believe in fMRI. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. So probably uh, most of the audience are the persons who tell much more about uh, the comparison of between the two techniques than me. Uh, 
but what's going on? Uh, so, um, as a, the uh, title uh, states, I'm not going uh, to focus on uh, um, technical details and technical comparison of the direct electrical stimulation and uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'm a linguist, um, a clinical linguist, a neurolinguist, and um, uh, I feel that uh, my job is to think about the linguistic part of the story. And uh, that's why I'll, uh, I prefer to focus on the lessons uh, we've learned in recent five, even five, seven years uh, using uh, direct electrical stimulation in the OR and uh, try to suggest uh, how we can transfer all that acquired knowledge to uh, the TMS practice. Uh, it is now uh, uh, clear uh, that from a um, methodological and clinical point of view, direct elect electrical simulation is a kind of gold standard which allows to reliably identify the functional eloquent brain areas, including the language one, linguistic ones. Um, but even more broadly, uh, uh, it allows us to work uh, at both cortical and subcortical level using different stimulation techniques, uh, uh, using different linguistic tasks and different uh, strategies of testing. And uh, the entire um, uh, desk and uh, Away craniotomy, I would say, enterprise is now quite developed from neurophysiological and linguistic point of view, not to say neurosurgical. Um, and as I see the picture now, the TMS enterprise ha suggests uh, some extra benefits uh, for the uh, clinical service, including uh, the shortened intraoperative time. Um, because we can map uh, fu a function uh, beforehand. Uh, it may ensure smaller craniotomy and um, overall it can help with enhancing surgical planning because, uh, for example, a patient is already uh, acquainted with the procedure that uh, she or he is prepared for potential um, language errors, speech errors, and the entire um, testing situation is less uh, stressful. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, comparing to uh, that, the DES enterprise, the TMS1 uh, is uh, less developed from uh, different points of view. And I would like today, I would like to focus on the linguistic part, but of course, I will also mention the uh, basic. Um, methodological issues as well, because uh, they kind of, uh, sometimes they uh, hinder us from further progress. Uh, so, um, talking about the procedure which I'm more experienced with, the language mapping with direct electrical stimulation, the, um, let's start with the, the let's just overview the, um, uh, the philosophy of the, um, entire procedure. Uh, so, wh why do we do that at all? Um, because clearly uh, there is pathology-driven neuroplasticity, especially in case of epilepsy and uh, slow-growing tumors. Uh, and um, this kind of uh, slowly developing neuroplasticity causes poorly predictable functional regularization. So, basically, in each particular individual case, clinical case, we don't know where the uh, eloquent function uh, is or where is the critical uh, node of the network. Um, so uh, then in contrast to those who believe in fMRI, um, I think that properly the functional neuroimaging and um, that's only me who thinks so. Um, so for the moment, the state of Affairs is that preoperative functional neuroimaging does not provide uh, critical or very reliable information about functional eloquent cortical areas because of two major factors, as we know, because of co activation uh, shown in the fMRI maps um, and the activation maps, and also because of 
uh, the fact that we uh, simply work with uh, those clinical populations uh, who, feature, who often uh, feature uh, neurovascular decoupling. Um, then uh, mapping with DAS, with the DAS, um, allows a quick and reliable identification of resection boundaries. So we can uh, easily help a surgeon uh, to do his or her job. And um, we can fill work both at the cortical and subcortical levels, which is very important considering um, recent advances in the, uh, about the involvement of uh, many white matter structures in the language and other cognitive systems. Um, so uh, how does it work? Uh, so we do, uh, considering language, we do functional speech and language mapping using intraoperative direct electrical stimulation, which uh, transiently trans interacts uh, locally with the small cortical or external side, but also non-locally, non which is important, uh, because the focal uh, disruption uh, works also at the network level. Um, and whenever uh, a specific linguistic or other cognitive deficit is repeatedly induced in a certain area through electrical stimulation, we mark this area as functionally eloquent, um, and um, the neurosurgeon keeps, tries to keep it spared. Uh, in this way, uh, we delineate functional boundaries of potential resection, and the pathology is removed within this specific boundary. Um, so to, this is the overview of uh, the most commonly used uh, awake craniotomy procedure, which is called um, AA, asleep, awake, asleep. There are different versions, um, and in Moscow we do both uh, asleep, awake, asleep. Uh, we follow this procedure and the full awake procedure as well. Um, and uh, my impression is that they do not really differ from the uh, functional outcome point of view. Um, so, uh, first at the sleep um, uh, stage, uh, the uh, patient is sedated, then uh, he or she is awakened, and uh, uh, this is the critical stage of the uh, uh, mapping procedure where the, the neurosurgeon applies electrical stimulation, and um, we, a linguist and the clinical neuropsychologist, uh, interact with the patient, and uh, the patient performs different tasks, linguistic or non-linguistic. And then, uh, when uh, we uh, finish mapping, uh, which can be in uh, several hours, uh, in the fact, because we also monitor uh, language and speech during the entire resection, uh, it's up to the medical team uh, uh, whether they prefer where the patient needs to be sedated completely uh, or um, uh, a patient can stay awake. So during the mapping uh, procedure, if the, we observe an error in a trial, in a single trial, we pause uh, mapping, uh, we mark the brain area stimulated um, and the uh, um, we record the error, we register the error in the protocol and classify it. Uh, so, of course, the, the um, procedure implies uh, coming back to the site, uh, each site, several times for verification, uh, not successively, but this is necessary. And if the error is reproducible, if it's reliably identified, then we mark the zone and the, the neurosurgeon tries to spare it. Um, so this is the um, uh, setup uh, for language mapping during an awake neurosurgery we designed um, quite some years ago. And uh, this specific scheme uh, was inspi inspired by um, a great figure in our field who unfortunately passed away some years ago, Peter Marian. And this is how we conceptualized uh, the, um, our interaction with the entire medical team and with the patient before we started. Um, and this is how it is in real life. Uh, so we basically a neural linguist interacting with the patient is uh, sitting or nearly lying uh, below the sheet, uh, which is the border between the, the uh, patient's face and the surgeon's face. And, um, 
despite the, uh, the, the, the procedure and the entire clinical situation is very serious, of course, um, they could be happy moments. Um, and here is the uh, standard uh, uh, result of uh, this procedure. For example, in this slide, you can see uh, the tags uh, with um, uh, language functional errors mapped in this specific patient. So the tag number one is located in the inferior frontal gyrus where we observed uh, uh, perseverations during naming. That was a naming test. And uh, these tags are in the superior temporal gyrus, and you can see that we we'll mostly observe speech arrest here. Um, so uh, now we can state that direct electrical stimulation serves as the gold standard for language mapping, and um, uh, it uh, went uh, a great uh, route. Uh, starting from 1874 and um, um, not very ethical, uh, as we believe, experimentations by Robert Bartholo, uh, and all through groundbreaking work made by Wilder Panfeld um, in the motor and language domain. And um, uh, here I give some references uh, at the bottom. Uh, suggesting and confirming uh, in multi-center studies that um, for the moment we can state that there is vast evidence in favor of awake surgeries uh, which ensure um, uh, larger resection volume if necessary, um, pathology driven, less postoperative deficits, less hospitalization time, and a longer postoperative lifetime. Um, so uh, let me give you a couple of examples um, uh, of the outcome uh, uh, of uh, like the, the nowadays results and the knowledge about uh, direct electrical stimulation mapping of language at the cortical and subcortical level. So here you can see um, uh, two pictures from 1959 from Penfold and Roberts and from Ojman uh, some years, some decades later. And this is uh, a naming task, object naming task. Um, so you can see that the maps, functional maps, uh, are basically very similar. And uh, here, Dr. Chang uh, listed uh, some of the most frequent errors that can be observed and taken as errors during language mapping using this uh, naming task. So the procedure is robust at the cortical level and um, at the uh, uh, subcortical uh, uh, level um, as well. Uh, it's uh, quite recent when uh, most of neurosurgery teams who do awake surgeries do it consistently, do wide matter mapping. Um, but uh, now it is a great enterprise and uh, with every year we know more and more about uh, linguistic and other cognitive uh, loads or functions of uh, white matter tracts, especially associative tracts uh, within the left hemisphere got a lot of attention. Uh, and um, for example, uh, you can see here uh, the arcuate, which is cons now consistently mapped um, by many uh, surgical teams with the long segment, with the anterior and posterior segment, and uh, here it's arguable, but um, here uh, this group uh, gives examples of errors um, produced um, or elicited by stimulation of these white matter tracts. Also, the um, SLF2 uh, uh, is uh, stimulation of this structure, uh, which is not always considered as a core linguistic structure, um, um, should be mapped for language. And uh, the entire ventral tract system, including the ansonate fasciculus, the ILF, um, and the uh, I4 fasciculus, um, which um, stimulation elicits um, is, is uh, related to uh, very specific errors. 
So um, getting closer to uh, the core of what uh, I'm worrying about, um, there's a linguistic test to use for the direct electrical stimulation. And then uh, may I ask to launch the second poll, um, which may help me to go on with my narrative. Sure, the poll is ongoing. Okay, we close the poll and share the results live. The answers are very interesting. 48% uh, say there is no optimal task. 26% uh, object naming, 13% action naming, 9% storytelling, and 4% counting. Is that what you expected? Well, let's discuss that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I would agree with the majority. Is that there is no optimal task, and this is now the state of the art. But it started um, all the way differently. So the initial set used for language mapping during awake craniotomy is uh, included uh, counting and very, very recently uh, just naming, object naming. Um, I'd, um, I'd like to say that uh, if you want to leave a patient uh, with counting, use counting in the OR. If you want to leave your patient with naming objects based on pictures, then do naming. Um, if you want a propositional speech, then you should go a little bit further. Um, so counting uh, obviously is not, it, it, it can be used when you, you uh, operate on uh, an already aphasic patient because she can do anything more. But uh, for um, a person with sped language properly, this is definitely not a task of the choice because it is simply um, a non-propositional language. This is not how we talk, but this is uh, automatized speech. And th there is vast literature showing that um, uh, it is uh, uh, based on uh, a very different brain uh, substrate comparing to normal language. Naming uh, is uh, still a task which is uh, frequently used in the OR, and uh, uh, I have nothing against it, per se. Um, I just think that we need something more. Uh, um, because naming is um, a very good task, in fact, because it, it is it involves a complex linguistic process uh, processes, uh, starting from semantic processing and even going beyond language, of course, I, I mean visual processing. Um, and um, it includes lexical access, very often grammatical encoding, uh, if we look at the naming across languages, because
still it gives I can give you a good impression. Um, the language is here conceptualized as uh, being processed um, within the dorsal root uh, of which the, uh, for example, the sensory motor interface, um, that is the interaction between inferior frontal areas and posterior superior uh, posterior temporal areas uh, is postulated uh, and which uh, is uh, considered by many um, the core of the language. This is something else I'm not going to discuss that in details. And then um, uh, there, there is there are actually uh, bilateral uh, ventral roots involving involving lexical interface, uh, combinatorial network, and you can see uh, already in this model the errors. And to us uh, who are involved in the work surgeries, uh, this is very much related to white matter networks which you can see here where I exemplify the uh, associative white matter tracts, uh, only the, the major uh, language related white matter tracts. And all of them are here in this model, so they connect these areas. Mm. So um, the state of the art in uh, the linguistic part of awake craniotomies and language mapping is that uh, we do not want to map anymore the language in general. Uh, we want to be very specific. We want to map a language aspect which is relevant for the specific site. Um, so uh, what we need and what is partially done at the moment for some of the languages, the language battery allowing uh, a clinical psychologist or a neurosurgeon or a linguist, neurolinguist, to pick up an appropriate task depending on the resection location. And um, I wanted to be very uh, obsessive compulsive in the next three slides, but I definitely don't have time for that. So you can get back to this wonderful uh, paper uh, by the uh, um, uh, by uh, Elke de Vida and uh, other colleagues and Peter Marian, uh, who uh, I think this is the, the, the for neurolinguistic part of awake neurosurgeries. Uh, they made something like while the panther did for the entire enterprise. So um, they um, overviewed the uh, functions of specific linguistic functions of specific areas and suggested a very specific interoperative task tasks for these uh, brain areas. And uh, you can see the examples here for the frontal lobe. And here uh, the areas are marked in color. And then uh, the language aspect involved is highlighted and the, an interoperative task is suggested. Same for the temporal and parietal lobes and um, same for subcortical structures. All these major tracts, white matter tracts involved in language processing and uh, connecting um, uh, language relevant areas. Of course, there are open questions. For example, we st we're still not sure which task is the most sensitive. For example, um, uh, for regarding a temporal lobe, uh, this is the work um, which is going on uh, at my lab. So um, the, the uh, group, um, uh, this group suggested some yeah. tasks and we uh, doubted that they're optimal. So now we're suggesting some others and testing their sensitivity. And for the, um, for example, for the temporal lobe, we compared the object naming and protein discrimination, like bash bash. Is it the same or different? Um, and you can see that the distribution is different. Uh, and here you can see the single subject data. Uh, this is the positive side for object naming, and this is for phoneme discrimination. So one is lying in the posterior part of the superior temporal judge, and another in the superior tem temporal sulcus. We expect that from neurolinguistic point of view, but uh, this is something to be done with uh, basically all the tasks suggested for interoperative mapping. We need to carefully uh, test their sensitivity. Same with the frontal lobe, for example, Action naming uh, and, uh, was suggested in verb generation, the best task for the inferior frontal gyrus mapping and the uh, sentence completion for the su supplementary motor area. 
but we compared naming, action naming, and uh, sentence completion, and showed that both in the inferior, posterior inferior frontal gyrus and the uh, pre and su supplementary proper supplementary motor area, uh, there is dissociation. Patient can complete, uh, can, can name an action, but cannot complete a sentence. And um, so um, the, the sentence completion tend to be uh, more specific, and when we mapped these uh, these are green sites or where the, this dissociation is shown, then we clearly see that they uh, are lying uh, on directly on or in close uh, proximity in the proximity of the individual trajectory of the frontal lesson tract. You can read more about that uh, in our recent paper. So. Um, where we are now uh, in the uh, with the direct electrical simulation uh, is uh, that we uh, have, or some people work on uh, developing it. We uh, have in hand an interoperative linguistic protocol, which encompasses both production and comprehension, um, and. Um, uh, can, and covers sorry both uh, different uh, language levels, starting from uh, repetition and phonological processing, going through the lexicon and semantics, and to the syntax. And also, reading and writing should be mapped when necessary. And of course, this kind of battery should be standardized. And this is a different type of work to be done. So th this is the example of the different tasks we use for um, the Russian language. So these are, I will not, uh, yeah, these are basically modern principles of um, uh, language mapping uh, during uh, awake neurosurgeries. So we do control mapping using this task, which I mentioned before resection and during it, stopping at, crit at critical points. And uh, uh, we use individual language tests selection relevant for the specific pathology location. And during this action, we practice spontaneous speech monitoring uh, in which we elicit an ex expressive language uh, in a patient in a dial. Um, so I don't think we have time for the poll, right? It's okay, we can run it all the yeah. Okay, let's do that. Great. Вот этот, который перед этим были. So we close the poll and share the results. 81% say yes to your question, 5% no, 14% no, we, uh, we need one basic task. And zero person for the last one. <laughs> okay. Right. So um, mm, I guess that we're on the same way with the audience because uh, I personally generally agree with the principle. But um, every now and then um, there is an idea coming up uh, in my group, and uh, especially uh, in neurosurgeons I'm working with that uh, we'd better have uh, one task. And it is a very good question, I think, and I don't have the answer at the moment, whether it should be um, a quite extensive, a complex linguistic task involving, involving many aspects of language, um, or it should be very basic uh, uh, core uh, linguistic task like sensory motor integration, like repetition, for example. Um, so this is something to uh, do research on um, in further years. So um, with um, I hope I uh, overviewed the uh, background and the baggage we have uh, in uh, uh, interoperative in the interoperative enterprise and um, the progress which uh, we um, reached in recent five seven years regarding the linguistic task and understanding uh, why we use this specific task in this specific area 
and in our attempt, uh, it is not finished yet, but still now we're really attempting to uh, test specificity of each task uh, to be perfect in the OR. Um, what do we have uh, regarding TMS? I might be wrong in some of my strong um, statements, but this is my uh, uh, the, the impression of uh, like the first year of working with TMS for cooperative mapping uh, purposes. Mm. So uh, obviously, the methodologies are different. This is clear. Uh, the uh, we start with uh, the same uh, assumption. Uh, both with uh, the DES and the TMS, that we what we do uh, we disrupt local neural activity uh, with the purpose to identify functional areas, but uh, we do it differently, obviously, using these two techniques. Um, the TMS uh, um, now mostly matched with neural navigation, and this is how it should be used for cooperative mapping. Uh, the TMS delivers pulses of magnetic stimulation directed through the skull, uh, elicit a small local electrical current, and this is how we cause virtual lesion. Uh, but obviously, again, the DAS and the TMS differ in stimulation frequency, current density, and direction. Uh, this, uh, this is electrophysiology. And as a linguist, I would be fine with that. Uh, as soon as uh, both techniques would allow me to do my job uh, uh, robustly, which is not really the case at the moment. At least this is my impression. Uh, for me, the um, largest problem is that uh, the, the language task used in both using both techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, with the DES, we have uh, gone uh, quite a route already. With the TMS, I think we're at the very beginning. So uh, only single object, a single word object naming is still usually used. This is the fact. Uh, some years before uh, people started testing different um, tasks, different linguistic tasks, I think with the same philosophy as we did uh, in interoperative mapping, but still this enterprise is not that developed as with the uh, awake neurosurgeries. Uh, this year, um, the Dutch group uh, were the, was the first one who published a standardized test for preoperative TMS mapping. For it is for English, German, and Dutch. So, for the first time, people tested the materials in the healthy controls, and then went for the TMS. So this is. Yeah, something that we've done with interoperative mapping years before already for many languages. And um, then uh, considering testing different uh, tasks, uh, people are still uh, at this step of comparison, action and object naming, mostly the two tasks. So we're not talking about sentence completion, Repetition of words, pseudo words, reading, writing, whatever, all kinds of linguistic functions distributed across the brain. Um, then, uh, on top of uh, those, uh, I think, fundamental linguistic problems we have with uh, TMS property mapping, there are some uh, uh, non linguistic issues, uh, which is not my business, of course, but as a linguist, I suffer from them. So the entire error frequency, the overall error frequency is quite low. And probably this is the reason why it's very often when an error is elicited in at least one of the stimulations is counted. So in uh, awake surgery, uh, the, this is something which is nearly impossible. So we uh, repeatedly uh, uh, verify each site. And if the site is positive, it is mostly positive, it's more than 50%. Uh, it's just, but if it's just one error out of 20 stimulations, we don't count it because it, it, it's not reliable, right? And we stimulate it next time and uh, the patient can do the job. The, here with TMS, 
the situation is different. And uh, for me, coming from the uh, interoperative uh, situation, that's um, not obvious that this is the right solution. And then uh, um, there is a different problem, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, Annie Uller uh, um, reported uh, last year at the Science of Asia conference uh, a significantly higher error rate for action that was action aiming in that case in the right hemisphere. Well, um, we, yes, language is a distributed system, but still uh, most of uh, aphasia uh, cases occur uh, after left hemisphere damage. That's close to 100%. Uh, so in, the, uh, in 20 healthy controls, we don't want, uh, we don't expect to see eloquent language areas in the right hemisphere and to see them more than in the left. This is a bit weird. Um, and also there were some other technical uh, issues uh, where I think the TMS is still vulnerable. Um, so uh, my statement is that, that we definitely have to use, uh, uh, and I would love to use them, the, the lessons we learned from uh, the interoperative language mapping to transfer, of course, with the necessary transformation, uh, this knowledge to the TMS enterprise. And um, uh, as a linguist, I see my job uh, in the next years um, and testing specificity of different linguistic tasks in different areas, as we do for interoperative mapping. Uh, um, and thinking about, of course, thinking carefully about the uh, sub-processes involved in every task, uh, linguistic or the cognitive uh, sub-processes, and taking into account available, um, which is quite vast, I should say, neurolinguistic knowledge about language and brain. And uh, from the methodological point of view, of course, we should do standardization of our linguistic tests. We suggest for appropriate PMS mapping. And then um, uh, from uh, the technical side, I expect other people do some progress uh, in increasing the reliability of the inhibition produced by TMS. Um, yeah, because otherwise, uh, all our linguistic efforts uh, are nonsense. Okay, I would like to acknowledge um, a few organizations and uh, many, many people. Uh, I'm now, at the moment, I'm uh, here in the middle of Russia at the Federal Center of Neurosurgery in Tumin, where I do white matter experimental dissections, which I'm going to continue right after the talk. I would like to thank uh, the many clinics where I do, uh, my team does uh, work neurosurgeries, and especially the uh, um, uh, medical surgery center uh, named after Pirogov in Moscow when we do most of our weeks. And I would like to, take, to, to thank um, the funding uh, uh, provided to my center for language and brain, which is led by me and uh, Dr. Rulin Bastianza from the University of Kroningen. Thank you very much.